welcome everybody to the Heart Coherence Collaborative. We are so honored to have Jack Canfield with us today. Uh, for anybody who doesn't know, I think I have the record for doing the most 10 day success <laughs> challenges in my life. Uh, so if anyone hasn't done that, there's a link below. It's a transformational 10 day event that is mind blowing. Um, and the goal sheet that you use as part of that event, I think I filled out at least 2000 of them and it's changed my life. So there's that. But then I realized you were on the Global Coherence uh, Committee, and then it took my respect for you to a whole other level. So we couldn't be more honored to have you with us. Well, I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Awesome. Yeah. So do you want to open up with a couple of minutes of coherence? Let's do it. Before we start. Let's dive into the heart, because that's what this interview is all about. So if everyone could focus your attention in the area of your heart. If it helps, you can put your hand on your heart. Now imagine that your breath is flowing in and out of your heart or chest area, breathing a little slower and deeper than usual. You can try a pace of five seconds on the in-breath, five seconds on the out-breath, in and out through the heart. Now, as you're breathing in and out through the heart, I want you to think about someone or something in your life that you really appreciate. Just really feel that appreciation and turn it all the way up as you breathe in and out through the heart. And next, still breathing in and out through your heart. Take yourself back to the last time you were in nature and you felt totally peaceful and at ease. If you can't remember a time, you can just imagine being in a nice place or your favorite place, breathing in ease. Now, lastly, as you breathe in and out through your heart, just want you to give deep thanks for your heart. Feel the strength of your heart, the gift of your heart. As long as your heart's beating, you have life. So really feel that thanks for your heart as you breathe in and out. And whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Okay, so I think probably everybody knows who you are. I'm a close second behind Kyle, having done all of your stuff <laughs> a million times. <laughs> but to ask you who you are, if today was your last day and you looked over your life, what would you say has been your most important work and your passion? Well, it's evolved. You know, I would say originally I wrote a book called 100 Ways to Enhance Self-Concept in a Classroom. And 400,000 teachers read and applied those principles in their classroom, teaching kids to accept, love, and appreciate themselves. And then obviously the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, which have sold over, this is hard to believe, 600 million copies in 51 languages around the world. Um, so just to think of that many people having been influenced by that. And then I think recently I have been doing a lot of work in the realm of spiritual evolution and helping people kind of, you know, eliminate the limiting beliefs that stop them from trusting their heart, trusting their intuition. And um, so writing a lot about that, working on a book about that. And um, I think that's going to be a major impact. So I, I would say, my purpose has always been to inspire and empower people to live their highest vision in a context of love and joy. And so I think I've done that. So I continue to do that. So that would be, I don't plan to have a grave because I think it's a waste of real estate. I want to be 
<laughs> we made it. <laughs> I did have a gravestone. I think that's what it would say. He spent his life teaching people to uh, live their highest vision in a context of love and joy and harmony with the highest good of all concerns. So, mm. yeah. We are uh, super honored to be speaking with you at Heart Mass Love Unleashed event coming up. Uh, you'll be presenting there. We'll be presenting there. But um, I wanted to just know, where did you first learn about heart coherence? I started an organization a long time ago called the um, Transformational Leadership Council. And it was a group of people who are doing transformational work that's experiential where you don't just talk to people but you have them experience things like you just led us through the heart coherence process so we experienced that and i think i met um deb rosman and howard at a conference that was called the evolutionary leaders conference they were all people doing this kind of evolutionary work and i thought oh my gosh you guys need to be part of this and so i invited them to be members and they were and then I got to go up to uh, Boulder Creek and met Doc and got to sit in a room with him and sip beer, <laughs> which yeah. was, like, I did not expect that. <laughs> <Yeah>. and, <laughs> and, uh, and talk about consciousness. So that was quite extraordinary and wonderful. Yeah. Uh, and then I just started using the the, the work in my own work and it, it was, um, it worked. So, you know, I always say if it works, use it. But that was way back. That had to be like, you know, almost 20 years ago, I think. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> so how do you use heart coherence in your life and everything you've learned? I use it in my own life and in my teachings. Um, but in my own life, whenever I feel the need to be relaxed, when I need to feel the need to be present, when I feel the need to... I don't get a lot of anxiety anymore showing up, but if I do, then I will do that. And the nice thing about it, you can do it with your eyes open. So you could be in a meeting, sitting in a conference room or on a table and do it to just kind of bring yourself back to inner peace. Um, I meditate, I won't say every morning, that'd be a lie, but probably four to five mornings a week. And I will meditate. If I'm running off to the airport at 3.30 in the morning for a five o'clock plane, I often don't. Um, but when I do, I have about five different meditations that I do. And different, you know, another one from Buddhist, another one from another woman who is a psychic medium, and, and a, one, a woman in a Kabbalah, which is a Jewish mysticism, and then also uh, heart coherence. So I never know which one I'm going to do until I sit down. Mm -hmm. And often I'll start with heart coherence and then go into a deeper, longer meditation after that. But it's a very quick way to just get there and there's something in neuro-linguistic programming called an anchor you know like if you hear a song like when you guys first met and that was a song that was your song and then like later you hear that song somewhere and you instantly go back to that moment where you met that anchors you back and with the heart coherence uh a quick coherence process i i don't even have to do the whole thing and i'm just anchored back into that state of you know being in that coherent state. So it's almost like shorthand for me. Yeah. So we have um, thousands of people that are about to go into the, the heart for 30 days. This interview is actually a part of our kickoff ceremony. Um, mm -hmm. So I was just wondering if you have any motivation to our following on why this is such an important thing to do and commit to for the next 30 days. Well, I often teach in my class that the longest journey you'll ever make is 18 inches from your head to your heart. <laughs> so it's not that long in terms of miles, but I think, you know, when we live from our heart and we're in that state of connectedness to our heart and we're in that coherent vibration, that everything we think of, everything we intend, everything we do um, works better because it's coming from that place. I mean, I literally just did an interview 30 minutes ago for an hour. And we talked about this. And I mentioned the research done at the HeartMath Institute about DNA. And you've got these strands of DNA and you have this intention people to, you know, I remember back when I was in college, one of my biology t teachers was a guy named John Hopkins IV. So you think about John Hopkins Hospital and he was a, you know, the, the in that lineage. And I remember we had to take 
whatever it was, and yet we ended up with DNA wrapped around a glass stick. And he was like, he almost had an orgasm. He was so happy <laughs> that we were able to do this. And I remember, and now, so at, at, at the Institute, they took DNA and they had people intend for the DNA, which is a helical structure, to, to unwind. And it didn't. And then they said, okay, now we just want you to send love and gratitude and appreciation to the DNA and nothing happened. And they said, now go into that state of appreciation and gratitude using the quick coherence process and now intend for the DNA to unwind. And it did. And they were able to get it to wind up again. So it's like for me, who've been a teacher of success for years, you know, written a book called The Success Principles, how to get from where you are to where you want to be. So there's all these principles and strategies for how to create what you want in life, manifest, whether it's money, relationships, health. If you're if you're doing that from a place of ego, from a place of resentment, from a place of being totally in your head, without your heart being part of it, without first going into the quick coherence, it doesn't have the same impact any more than a DNA unwound. So literally when we combine the two, it's like all of a sudden you have this magical combination of what it needs. It's like having an engine without gasoline. It doesn't go anywhere, you know? And so for me, I think, you know, because I teach so much about success, I think it's really critical to have that, that combination, if you will. And so I think that, and, and you know, we, we talk a lot today about the law of attraction and every, you know, how we can attract things by visualizing them, imagining them, doing affirmations, trusting that they'll happen, ask, believe, receive the movie, the secret and so forth. But what I've found and, and what I've discussed with lots of spiritual teachers is you can have all, all those tools, but if you're not in a high vibration of in the highest vibrations are appreciation and love and joy. And so the quick, the quick coherence process for me takes you there very quickly. And, um, you know, something I've been adding lately, I, I, you know, Greg Braden, and he's a big proponent of his work, and something he shared with me a while ago was that if you take this love that you have in your heart, this appreciation, you know, and you said appreciate, you know, a pl place, a person, whatever, a thing. I always say a person, animal, place, or thing. So it could be your guitar, it could be your cat, it could be a place in nature, it could be your wife, which is usually who I appreciate. And what I then do is I've added something, which is now imagine from your heart a beam of light extending out to them, surrounding, filling, and protecting them. And that's when I get this huge smile on my face because I as long as I'm not just feeling it, I'm, I'm radiating it, I'm sharing it, I'm, I'm extending it. And then I bring that back. And, and what you said was that, you know, imagine your own heart, feel your heart. So now I imagine that love and that light in my heart and then extending all through my body up into my head down into my toes so i'm sharing that with me as well appreciating me there's a there's a wonderful technique that the indians you know native that the people in india teach called the inner smile where you just send a smile to you, all the parts of your body so i'm sending that light from my heart from the quick coherence process and then i'm like i'm like stoned you know i mean it's like it's just <laughs> a, the greatest feeling so to be in that state, now anything I intend, anything I want to bring into being, goals, et cetera, have that extra energy, you know? And it, if you look at Abraham, who channels through Esther Hicks and the, the law of attraction work that they do, the, they always say, nothing's more important than you feel good because the vibration is what does the attraction. The intention is the goal your emotions, the vibration is like the 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 the, the gas. The, 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 you know, so the thing will happen. It has to have that energy to it. And so for me, being in that state of high vibration, which we can bring on in the minute or two, as you guys did in the beginning here, and it's always available. It's always available in a moment's notice. And I remember teaching in my seminars. I, I work a lot with uh, C-suite people and entrepreneurs, solo entrepreneurs, small, small cap business people. And I'll ask them to think about what is a challenge you have in your life? What is a challenge you have in your business? 
And I remember the first time I did it, the challenge I had was my sister who had been through rehab, uh, had accidentally got into the drug addiction through much like Michael Jackson. She was over opiated by a doctor when she had an injury and then she became addicted and then she went to rehab, but then she kind of got into a place where I was taking care of her, spending thousands of dollars a month for her care. And I started to resent it and I didn't want to do it anymore. So my solution was coming from resentment. <laughs> it was not a great place. <laughs> and then, so I'm teaching these people to do this. And, and I, so I do it with them. I always do it with people. And so I said, like, you know, now you've got this business problem. Now go in the state, which we did. We did a heart, the quick coherence. And now ask the question, see what answers come. They're always of a higher order. They're always better. They're always more inclusive. They're always more, more loving, more compassionate. And I just got this beautiful, beautiful answer for what I needed to do with my sister, which was coming from love and empowerment rather than from resentment and feeling used and so forth. So uh, for me, it's just so valuable to be able to do that at any moment, to take myself there. And then everything works better as a result of it because you're in that higher vibration. Thank you. Yeah, I know you've said people really struggle to get into the emotional states that they want to be in. Mm -hmm. I have heard rumor that you use an inner balance. And I wondered if you could talk about how that helps people because people do have a hard time, first of all, just developing a habit. Mm -hmm. And second of all, really cultivating the emotional states they want that could get them to the life they want. I knew you were going to ask me that because you sent me some questions to look at. <laughs> <laughs> so I looked at that question. And I went, oh, what is it? How is inner balance different than what we're talking about? So I'm not sure I can answer that unless you kind of remind me what it is. I, I looked for Doc's book last night. I have 3,000 books and I'm actually reorganizing my library and I couldn't find his book. So um, catch me up and I'll, I can give you a better yeah. answer. Well, first of all, it it might not be true, and you might just have the motivation and the ability to develop a habit, which I can change the question into that. The inner balance yeah. is that technology where you put it, the sensor in your ear and it actually measures your coherence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I think you've used that, but you might actually- I have. have. And what did you, how, what kind of, how did that help your practice? Well, for me, uh, the thing it did for me, and also I, I used to use that. I used to get these little ear things for everybody in my seminars, you know, and um, and then I also had a program on a computer that would show everyone in what was happening. And so it was just a way of externalizing on a graph, if you will, and showing them. And in fact, what you think is your feeling is actually measurable scientifically. Here's what's going on. You can see the the colors change, you know, whatever. Uh, and so for me, that was like a great tool to give a outer dis outer demonstration of what's going on inwardly. For example, your computer that you're using right now, mine, there's a there's a hard drive. And what's in the hard drive, we can't see that, but we can see the screen. The screen's telling us what's going on in the hard drive. So basically, what I loved about the 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 technology. And, and and Deborah just sent me this new app, which I've not yet downloaded and done it. Um, I promise her I would within the next couple of weeks. But the point be, being that when you can see it there on a screen, then you you trust that it's actually happening. And I think that was what was valuable for myself. I, I remember my son one Christmas, um, he I gave him a couple of presents. He was a clothes hound, so I bought him a nice coat. I gave him $300 for clothes. This is when he was in high school. And then I said, I want to teach you a technique. And I taught him the quick coherence process as a uh, Christmas present. I said, come out to my office. And this is the last present I'm going to give you. Uh -huh. And a couple of months later, he said, you know, dad, that present of all the presents you gave me, teaching me the quick coherence process was the best one. And I said, uh -huh. why? He said, because I use it now before tests at school. And so he used to get kind of test anxiety because he's afraid he's going to forget the answers and all that. And so that tool uh, was very valuable. But I think, you know, going back to your question, being able to see it, it takes away any doubt that your intellectual mind might have. And you just go, okay, this is working. I can see it right here on the screen or the green, you know, they used to turn a different color. So that's how I used it. Hmm. Yeah, so uh, when I was struggling, like, you know, 10 years ago, I was struggling a lot with anxiety and fear. One of the things that pulled me out 
was like following people who are really helping others you know like mm -hmm. yourself like wayne dyer like tony robbins i'm curious where this spark came uh from in you were there role models or did a life event happen uh because it's it's amazing to just observe how many people you've touched yeah you know what happened was i i i I went to graduate school at the University of Chicago. So I went undergraduate at Harvard. Not that I was the smartest guy. I graduated from the half of the class that made the top half possible. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I wasn't a genius. But I remember uh, the Vietnam War was going on and the civil rights movement was really big. And I thought, I want to make a difference in the civil rights movement. I want to help educate Black kids in inner city schools. And I remember... Uh, going to the University of Chicago uh, to go to the School of Ed. And we had this day where we got to visit schools um, and see what really went on in the school, high school. And we went to this one place aptly named Rich Township High School. And it really was rich. It was a suburb. Back then, all the girls were wearing plaid mattress skirts and circle pins on their blue shirts. And, you know, they, their, their, their home economics class looked like a newly remodeled kitchen, you know. And then we went to the next school. It was called DuSable High School, which Time Magazine actually that year said was the worst high school in America. And, uh, you know, the, the teachers didn't want to be there. All the bright teachers had kind of transferred out to the suburbs. Uh, they had guards at the door because of, you know, guns. And the kids were not motivated. And the teachers were not motivated. And I remember thinking, well, I could really help here. I could really make a difference. And so I really focused on my education and said, I want to go practice teach in a black school. And our second year of, of that program was three fifths teaching. I taught in the school from eight in the morning till three o'clock. It was really all day long practice teaching for a year in this high school that was 99% black. And I realized about maybe a month or two into it, that my kids, I was teaching history. My kids didn't have any self-esteem. They all didn't believe in themselves. Their self-confidence was low. Most of them have never been more than five blocks from their house or their condo or apartment. And I thought, I'm going to start teaching self-esteem. So I went and I took a course at a place called the W. Clement and Jesse V. Stone Foundation. W. Clement Stone was a friend of Napoleon Hill, who wrote a thing called a book called Think and Grow Rich, which was a classic motivational book. And I started taking some of the techniques they were teaching there and teaching them in my classroom. My kids started learning. They started getting A's. When they were suspended or something else, they would sneak into school, come to my class and sneak back out again because they didn't, they didn't want to miss my class. you know. And so then the, 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 the administration said, um, what you're doing is working. We want you to teach it to the other teachers. So I started teaching them all these techniques of kids sharing their goals. They're teaching how to visualize and do affirmations and take action and believe in themselves and you know all that kind of stuff, keep victory logs and so forth. And then I started going out and teaching teachers in other school systems and eventually had my own consulting business. But that's how it evolved. And then somewhere along the road, someone helped us come up with a life purpose. You know, I you're gonna come up with your life purpose statement. And that's where I came up with, you know, inspiring and empowering people to live their highest vision in the context of love and joy. And later I added in the context of love and joy. Um, I mean, if I added in, in, in harmony with the highest good for all concern. That was when the big crash happened and all the real estate people were basically doing all this stuff that made the stock market fall apart. And they were only interested in themselves, not anyone else. And so it evolved slowly, but now it's, it's who I am. It's what I do and it's how I see myself and what my purpose is. Nice. I would love to go back to the concept of self-esteem because I think mm -hmm. at a certain point there was a self-esteem movement in schools and I think it kind of fostered almost this empty, almost like kind of narcissism. But I think self-esteem now they're kind of realizing that it's more about doing esteemable acts, about action, about caring for others. Can you talk about the concept of self-esteem and how you think it's best Learned well, I, I think, you know, self-esteem, the word esteem comes from the Latin word istimari, which means to estimate. And so it's, it's your estimate of how valuable you are, how worthy you are, how good you are. Self-esteem psychologically is made up of three functions. Your, uh, how, do you feel lovable? 
Do you feel capable and do you feel significant? So lovable means I'm worthy of love. People, you know, love me. I'm worthy. You, you see a lot of people who've had childhood traumas where their parents didn't pay attention to them. They didn't get included. They were sexually abused. They felt something's wrong with me. I'm not lovable. The second part is capable. Am I able to handle whatever life gives me? So if you feel that no matter what shows up, you're going to be able to handle it, then you feel capable and competent. And obviously we have different areas where I might feel competent in relationships, but not competent with mathematics or not competent in business. So it can be specific. And a friend of mine just came up with a term called comp existential, existential competence, meaning that you feel no matter what shows up existentially, you can handle it. And because we were talking about how the future is unfolding so fast now with AI and robots and computers and, you know, all the stuff that are we able to keep up with all that? And then the last part is significant. Do I matter to anybody? You know, you could feel capable and lovable, but if you're not doing anything that matters to other someone else, you know, like what you're doing right now matters to people. You're leading these challenges and people are getting value, so you matter. So those are the three things that 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 are the pillars of self-esteem, if you will. And I think back in the day when I was doing self-esteem in a classroom, we were looking at all that, you know, like you've got to feel like you can do things. And not everybody is capable of everything. There are five different intelligences. There's verbal intelligence. These people you see on, you know, the home shopping network who can talk for 30 minutes about a ring. You know, I, I don't have that ability to do that. You know, it's like I run out of words really quickly on a on an emerald ring. There are people that have physical intelligence. They're dancers. They are ice skaters. They are football players, et cetera. There's musical competence, you know, Taylor Swift, people that can sing, can dance. I mean, can, you know, develop music and play an instrument. And there's there's a, a emotional intelligence, people who become therapists and counselors and so forth. And there's spatial intelligence, designers, architects, so forth. So, and, and artistic intelligence, people like my wife, she paints, you know. So we have all these different intelligences and you're not gonna have all of them. And so unfortunately schools, tend to um, really support verbal intelligence. So if you can listen to something and feed it back, you know, uh, in mathematical intelligence, you're going to do well in school. But if you're kinesthetically intelligent and you learn more by moving around and doing things and so forth, and your teacher's just talking to you all day long, you're not going to do well in school. You're going to probably drop out, you know, and then go race cars on the weekend or something. So we have to like give ourselves permission to know what are the things we're good at and honor that and not compare the fact that we're a good baker or a mechanic to someone who's a you know a great accountant who's probably making more money than you are because of that. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's a lot of people watching right now. Uh some are doing great in life and there might be some struggling. You know, there's so much different energies going on in the world right now. It's intense mm -hmm. times. Curious if you have any messages uh, or message for anybody that's listening that might just be struggling right now. Yeah, you know, first of all, there's always going to be challenges in life. And one of my favorite books recently is called What's in the Way is the Way, that everything that shows up in your life is actually for you, not against you. That that issue that you're having to deal with, the, the, maybe the, the, the a divorce, the loss of a child, um, you know, maybe you've got a, you still got COVID, you know, whatever. These things are things that if you approach them correctly, have lessons for you, you're going to develop courage, strength, perseverance, the ability to ask for help, you know, qualities that you may not develop otherwise. Maybe you're going to develop compassion that allow, leads you toward your career, you know. Um, like I was an abused child. So basically, I have a lot of of awareness of that, which makes me a really good counselor for anyone who's ever been abused, you know? So that led to a lot of my early work as a, as a, I was a, a, a psych psychologist for many years that I might not have been otherwise. And so um, the, to really look at that, but someone once said that um, um, pain is required, struggling is optional. And what I mean by that is if you learn the tools, there are tools for success. So obviously, you know, the, the, the things that the hard math teaches, these are tools that are usable for consciousness, for inner peace, for health, for relationship peace, and so forth. There are other tools for how to manifest, you know, how to write a book. How do you sell real estate? 
How do you, um, you know, be a healer? How do you do Reiki work? How do you become a massage therapist? So there's different skills that we can learn. And I think when you're struggling, you have to ask yourself, what am I resisting? Because there's something wanting that's pushing you in a direction, pushing against you or pushing you towards something. And usually we're resisting that. We Often we resist asking for help because we grew up. You know, my dad, when I went to college, said, if you need a helping hand, look at the end of your own arm. He was basically teaching me you're on your own. And, you know, there was some good stuff about that, but also it was a little scary. So for years, I never asked for help. I could be walking across the street with five suitcases and a guitar on my back. And you'd say, can I help you? And I'd say, no, I'm fine. You know, <laughs> instead of saying, thank you, I'll take the help. So we have to learn to ask for help, to be open to help, to go inside and ask our intuition. This is one of the great things about heart math is when you're in these states that we talk about, that's the perfect state to ask your intuition for guidance. Whether you call it your intuition, guardian angel, Jesus, Buddha, whatever, there's guidance available for us, but you have to be in that state. It's kind of like a funnel. You know, you want to turn the funnel upside down so there's a big opening for all this wisdom to come in from, you know, source, spirit, your high self, whatever you want to call it. And so the struggle usually means there's something I'm not paying attention to that I need to pay attention to. Pain in your body tells you something's off. Um, I'm a big believer in the work of Abraham, Esther Hicks, where they talk about joy is your guidance system. If you're not experiencing joy, that doesn't mean that every second you're loving, you know, cleaning up your son's vomit when they're three years old because they got the flu. But if you're not enjoying your job, if you're not feeling joy in your relationship, if you're not feeling joy, you know, in your daily activities, if you have a headache at the end of every day, then you're off purpose. You're off course. This way of nature's way of saying you're off course. So we have to pay attention and struggle. As I said, I think is optional. To, what song did we all sing as a kid? Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 merrily. Joy, 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 joy. Life is but a dream. It's an illusion. And so basically, if we cooperate with where we feel the greatest joy and go there toward the people that love us, toward the things we enjoy doing, like I teach everyone in my seminars, make a joy list. What are 20 things you love to do? And when you're feeling out of sorts, pick something on the list and do it. It could be listening to Bob Dylan songs. It could be petting your cat. It could be gardening. It could be um, dancing. It could be doing Tai Chi. It could be going and getting a massage. It could be cooking. You know, whatever it is, have that list. One of my professors in college called it your anti-depression list, you know, and and quick coherence should be on that list because it's always available, you know, reaching out to a friend, uh, you know, asking someone to just listen to you cry for 10 minutes, whatever it might be. It's always available. Hugs. Another thing, most people don't get enough hugs. Um, you know, they're afraid. And we know uh, the, one of my great teachers was a woman named Virginia Satir. She said, you need eight hugs for survival, 12 for maintenance, or, uh, and wait, eight for survival, 10 for maintenance, 12 for growth, 12 hugs a day. If you're not getting 12 hugs a day, you're not growing. And so basically um, that's another big piece of that. Mm. Um, I read this quote that you said where, I'm going to just read it. For centuries, the world's greatest teachers have been advising us to follow our heart. Impeccable scientific research inspired by Doc Childre's deep wisdom about the truth of who we are proves that a few simple heart-centered techniques done consistently over time can transform the whole world. I'm not exaggerating when I say heart intelligence should be required reading for everyone on the planet. So I wonder right. if you could talk about what you got out of heart intelligence. Well, well again, I, I, I don't remember everything I read in that book. And I looked for that book last night, as I mentioned, I couldn't <laughs> find it. But what I take away from all of the work I've done with, with, with Deborah and Howard and Doc and everybody is that when we see the heart, this is something most people don't know. The heart has neurons. The heart thinks. The heart's a the heart. Ha, it's a it's a, it's its own brain, if you will, and it's smarter than the one up here. When information comes into our system, into our nervous system, it goes to the heart before it goes to the brain. So we have a feeling about something before we have a cognitive thought about it. 
And so therefore we need to pay attention. And, you know, we know the heart can create a field. You've seen all those examples of the Taurus around the body, but it's created from the heart. And so if we go to the heart and ask our heart for guidance, for its opinion about things, trust our heart, trust what we're drawn to, to me, the law of attraction isn't just about attracting things to us, but acknowledging and honoring what we're attracted to, the people, the music, the seminars, your your challenge, whatever it might be. If I'm attracted to that, trust that. You know, um, so many of us are talked out of what we want to do. I was just interviewing a woman. I, I do some private coaching, and I had a woman this morning. She's Japanese, and she lives up in um, in um, Montreal. And she speaks impeccable English. And I asked her about where did she learn to speak impeccable English? She said, I was in Japan and I fell in love with the group Do Kids on the Block. Mm -hmm. And they had these wonderful songs and I love their music, but I didn't know what the lyrics meant. So I wanted to learn English so I could understand the lyrics. And then she said, after she started studying it a little bit online, she said, I want to go to America and go to school in America. And her mother said, you can't afford it. You'll never go. It's too expensive. And she said, no, I want to go to school in America. I'll save the money. She started working after school. She started ditching her math classes and studying English and so forth. She ended up coming to the University of Washington in Washington, D.C. She got her degree. And her mother eventually excuse me, said, if you're this committed to it, that you're willing to work after school, I will help pay for your college education. And for two years, she told her, you're wasting your time. You shouldn't do this. But in her heart, she knew. She trusted her heart, not the brain, which said it's too expensive. You can't afford it. You won't get a visa, all that stuff. So the the heart has wisdom. You know, we have intellectual understanding, but there's wisdom that comes from the heart. And so we need to listen to the heart. We need to trust the heart. And, and again, all the technology for how to tune into it is is taught through the things you guys are into. So you're going to be speaking at Heart Maths Love Unleashed event. That's going to be yeah. in May, and there's tickets below for anyone interested. Um, your talk is called "Love Is the Answer." Give us a little mm -hmm. bit, a little little taste. Obviously, it's about love, but maybe go on a little bit. Yeah. Well, I think you know the, the probably the. The qualities of the heart, we all think of the heart, we think of love, we think of Valentine's Day, you know, we think of the heart's love, you know, uh, the, the Beatles song, Love is the Answer, well, no, it's the demo, someone else, they did the song, Love is the Answer, I, that was a song, I just sang it for years, da, 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 love is the answer, and so, you know, the reality is that whenever you think of anything that's going on, the solution is love, let's take the Middle East right now, we have you know, the Israelis, we have the Palestinians, they're at war, they've been at war for God knows when. I just read an amazing book called Israel, the most misunderstood country in the world. And the reason it's so intractable is the Muslims have this belief that once, a, once I think the Arabs combine with the Muslims, have this belief that once land has been occupied by them, it should be occupied by them forever. Okay, so that means the Israelis who came in after them at some point, they believe they shouldn't be there. So they want to wipe them off from the from the desert to the sea. Let's get rid of them. At the same time, the Israelis have been attacked. I think there's been eight wars that have happened basically to kill them. Like we're going to annihilate you. So now you've got people who are looking at you and your only goal is to kill me. And my only goal is to get you off this land to kill you. So like that's not a solution. And yet you get people, parents who have, and I've helped facilitate some of these, where you get Israeli mothers and Palestinian mothers together, and the usually the women go there faster because they want their children to grow up and be fed and have peace and everything. And they get together in groups and they start talking, they realize they have the same goal. They love their their kids, they want they love their parents, they love the their their relatives, they want peace. Okay, so if they could literally have this love as opposed to this belief system that's built on old beliefs and this hatred that's now you've killed my brother, so I got to kill your brother. So now it goes back and forth until eventually someone says, okay, we got to stop. You look at apartheid in South Africa, what Mandela was able to do. He stopped resenting his jailers who jailed him for years and said, I'm going to choose to forgive you and love you. And that changed the game. 
Now, is it perfect in South Africa? No. Is it much, 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 much better? Yes, because they went from resentment and, and getting even and all that and forgiving to love. So we all have to get to the place where we can forgive each other and love each other. And any situation I've ever been in, I'll give you another example. A story we did in our first Chicken Soup book was about a, a rabbi and this Nazi, you know, just, you know, they had a Nazi tattoo on his arm, you know, the, the swastika. And he was, and he basically tried to burn down his synagogue. And then this, this Nazi became um, a, a quadriplegic. And so now the, the, the rabbi took him in and take, took care of him in his wheelchair. And they fell in love with each other because love trumped the Nazi hate for Jews. And, and this story is a beautiful story, but it's just a matter of creating an environment and creating a belief and having people move toward it. And then you can solve any problem. I look at America right now, we have the far right and the far left. And, and so like the people on the far right are saying, you know, the border's out of control. And I'm a liberal and I think the border's out of control right now a little bit as well. But the, the, the reality is that if you were a mega person, you were going like, you're letting all these people in that are going to take my job. And so over here on the left, people are saying, no, no, we got to be compassionate, let all these people in. But we're not saying to the other person, hey, I care about you having a job. We're not, we're not saying I care about you. We're not making your reality a safe space. So if I can create a safe space for you, and you know that I got your back, then you're willing to listen to me and know that I'm willing to now have your back because we care about each other. So that importance of like talking to each other and letting you know, I really want to listen to your concerns. I care about you enough to care. I'm willing to do things to make sure that you're okay as well as I'm okay. Then we can have solutions. And I've seen that happen over and over between gang members where two gang leaders start to say, you know, we're killing each other. We got to stop this stuff. And they literally disarm their gangs and stop killing each other. I've seen that happen in the inner cities of San Francisco. So I really believe love is the answer. Someone has to go first. And, uh, you know, <laughs> it's going to be those of us who are conscious. We have to do that. And and a lot of people that are conscious still are looking down on people that they think aren't conscious. And that's that's still called judgment. And it's not love. Well said. That was so well said. Can you tell us about the upcoming event that you have? Sure. We're doing a, an experience called Breakthrough to Success. It's a three-day seminar. It's um, mostly uh, online, so people can tune in from anywhere, do it from home. Uh, we used to do it live all the time, but now you save the airfare. You don't have to pay for a hotel and food and all that stuff. And uh, we, we've had as many as you know 800 people in the seminar from all over the world. People make friends with people in Israel and India and South Africa and you know Azerbaijan and so forth, and that's been a lot of fun. And it's three days to do the following. We start with getting clear about your life purpose because we believe everyone has one. Most people don't know what theirs is. So there's a tech, couple techniques for discovering that. Then like, what's the vision for your life that will actually help you fulfill that purpose? Then what are the goals, specific measurable achievements that you can do that will help you create that vision for your life? And one of the things we do is we create what we call a breakthrough goal. What is the goal you could achieve in 12 months from now that would break you through, I mean, a quantum leap in some area of your life, whether it's financial, professional, relational, um, you know, health, whatever it might be. And then we are teaching you the techniques and tools, some of which are mental and emotional, like quick coherence, which we teach. We teach affirmations, visualization, teach a couple of different meditations uh, as well. We teach you something called the rule of five. How do you take five actions every day um, to manifest that goal. Uh, accountability. How do you build accountability in your life? Most people that are listening to us right now are people that are solo entrepreneurs. They've, they've got their coaching business. They're a massage therapist. They're a meditation teacher, yoga teacher, or they got a small business and um, they don't have a boss. So no one's holding them accountable to do the uncomfortable things. We tend to do the comfortable things instead of the uncomfortable things. So how do we build that accountability into that with other people in the seminar mastermind groups, which is groups of six people that can support each other uh, that can come out of that. We um, look at uh, a lot of different strategies you can apply. And what happens is people, my favorite thing to do 
is something called belief change work, where everyone, including you guys and me, we have limiting beliefs in our subconscious that we're not even aware we have. But when we go to pick up the phone to make that call, somehow we hesitate. When we go to say, oh, I want to do the seminar, but then we don't schedule it, you know, whatever. There's some fear, something in there. And it, it usually was between the ages of three and eight when it happened. You know, we got rejected, we got bullied, we got hurt, we got ignored, we got punished, whatever. And some part of us said, well, that's never going to happen again. And the way I'm going to avoid that is I'm going to develop this little persona here that's going to protect me. And it does, but it's now protecting us. I use the metaphor, imagine you see someone walking down the street and they're wearing flippers and a wetsuit and they got a mask on and they got oxygen tanks on their back and you go, you don't need those. You're not in the ocean anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but we're walking around like that with all this protective gear that we've developed as a child to survive. So we want to identify what that is, release it and replace it with more empowering and inspiring uh, and positive beliefs. And we have a couple powerful techniques that I do that literally it just amazing transformation. So that happens and it's three days and um, it's, 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 it, I, can, I can tell you how life-changing it is. I mean, people will talk about before Camfield and after Camfield, you know, how about how their life switched. Oh. I'm writing a book right now called living the success principles. It's all stories of people who either took the seminar, read my success principles book and they became multimillionaires. They got out of abusive marriages. They married their soulmate. They wrote the book they always wanted to write, you know, whatever it is. So you come out like, a, it's like a car wash. You know, you come out the other side, all clean and shiny, ready to go with all the strategies and support to achieve what's going to bring you the greatest joy and happiness in your life. And um, it's, it's, we start like around nine o'clock West Coast time. And we go until... Sometimes, you know, seven, eight at night, and it's just, it's phenomenal. And um, there's, you can do a regular ticket. We've got a VIP ticket, which gives you more access to like recordings of the training afterwards. You can rewatch things or listen to meditations again, or if you miss something, you can do that. And also there's more swag and more different kind of benefits that you get. And for the first time, we actually have 40 spaces as we, as we record this and, um, we sold two more today. I know that. But what happens is we have a studio next to where we record. We go to South Carolina. We're in a studio. we got these big video screens where we can see 40 people on a screen. So there might be like, you know, 30 screens, you know, of 40 people each. And I can walk up to the screen and say, hey, Kyle, or hey, Leah, and call you out and talk to you. And, you know, you could raise your hand and I can see you. And so it's like being in a real room. And we break out into small groups. We could do partnership exercises. It's quite phenomenal what the technology allows us to do. But we're going to have 40 people that can actually be in the room next to us and be doing it live with us, as well as like watching on screen. And then also we'll have a chance to take pictures, do autographs, eat meals with you, et cetera. So all of that's on the website. You can find out more about it. And uh, you just need to go to Jack Canfield forward slash Kyle, and you can find out about the different offers and you can get a $50 discount by just where it says promo code. You just type in the words, capital letters, S A V E five O save 50. So that's all available to anyone that's watching us right now. Yeah. We'll have that in the description below. And, yeah. We hope to see everyone there. One funny story is that this group was actually a goal. Those the creation of this group was a goal as part of my 10 day success principles. So thank you. Oh, beautiful. For, yeah. Yeah. It's so cool. Yeah, I mean, amazing. Now that now because of that, there's going to be tens of thousands of and people doing heart coherence for 30 days. So beautiful things can happen. This was such an amazing interview. So Jack, it was great to meet you. One thing that I'm especially grateful for, besides all of it, I'm going to now adopt that that breathing technique where you send that beam of love uh, and then bring it back and radiate appreciation. We'll do that now at the beginning of our interviews and we'll call it the Jack and Greg special. So <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Yeah, this was so cool. It, it's just such a full circle moment. And we hope you'll come back with us again on a future challenge. Yeah, love to. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Jack. Bye, everybody. Right. Okay, keep up the good work. Me. Love you guys. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack Canfield. You probably know me as a co-author of the Chicken Soup for the Soul book series and a featured teacher in the book of the movie, The Secret. 
And I want to invite you to a very special and important event called Love Unleashed, which is being produced by the HeartMath Institute on May 16th and 19th, where I'll be presenting along with Deborah Rosman, Howard Martin, Greg Braden, and Lynn McTaggart, and a whole host of other people. And I'll be doing a presentation called Love is the Answer, where I'll be guiding you on how to overcome some of the obstacles to the full expression of love, such as fear and the unconscious limiting beliefs that we have, and how to reconnect with the essence of your soul, which is love. I look forward to seeing you there.